All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for joining this session. And thanks so much for coming to the conference. It's great to see you all here. We've had a fantastic response to this event throughout the day. Really great numbers and engagement and interaction. I'm really interested to know where people are joining us from. So if I can ask you to just pop your location in the chat box, that's always really interesting for us to see. Okay, my name's Tom. I work for English UK putting on these events and I just have to go through a quick bit of housekeeping before handing you over to Chris. So firstly, just to say, we really um, couldn't put this event on without the support of our sponsors. So thanks so much to Ensley Insurance, Cambridge Assessment English, Macmillan Education, Language Cert, and Trinity College London. Their support is a big part of what makes this event, of how we can run this event like this and what makes it a success. So thanks to them. Okay, during the talk, if you do have a question, pop it into the Q&A box, and then at the end of the session, I'll reappear and we'll start to run through the questions. So if you do have questions, we will be taking them, write them in the Q&A box, and we'll tackle them at the end. If the worst should happen and the session drops out, give us a minute to mess around behind the scenes and get things running again, and then join using the original links. So if it drops out, give us a minute, join on the original links and we will have it back up and running for you. Okay, so with that bit done, just to say, we, I think, I hope you've seen in the program, we're really try, trying to have issues and important themes under discussion. And of course, today is Earth Day. So we're super pleased to have Chris Etchells join the program, who will talk about those with us. And Chris, thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for everything that you and ELT Footprint do and have a great presentation. Thank you very much, Tom. Right, I'm just gonna share my screen with you and then we can make a start. There we go. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, no doubt let me know if you can't for any reason, Tom. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Hello everyone this afternoon or whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, I want in this presentation to try to give you an overview of green ELT, um, the background to our situation, why it's important, how to identify and use the powers that you have uh, to help bring about positive change. I'll be talking from a UK perspective, but the, the climate and ecological crisis is obviously global. And I hope those of you joining us in other countries will find value in what I have to say as, as well. Uh, you probably know that our colleagues in the British Council have been conducting their own international survey on green ELT, and I'm sure they'll have more to say about how organisations are responding internationally. In the course of the talk, I'm going to talk about my own organisation, English Country Schools, and how we've responded to the challenges. And I hope our experience will provide ideas and insight for you to use in your own context. I'll also talk about ELT Footprint UK, which we hope will provide support for your efforts. And I'll describe how we can deal with feelings of overwhelm when faced with what can sometimes feel like the enormity of this crisis. Uh, I think that might resonate with some of you. I've called all this the landscape of green ELT. And as with any landscape, um, it's helpful to have a map um, for us to navigate with. So here it is. Now, um, as you'll see, there's, there's quite a lot here and I have less than 30 minutes to go through it. So I'm not gonna be able to cover every detail. Um, the map and presentation will, however, uh, be available to download from ELT Footprint to UK um, or from English UK in the next few days. So, I'll be looking at the operational background we currently find ourselves in, as I've said, and I'll be asking why it matters to us in ELT. And then I'll spend a, a bit of time looking at how you can identify and use the powers that you have to act. And finally, I'll look at sources of information and advice uh, to help you in your efforts. If there's time, there should be a few minutes at the end, or if I time things correctly, there should be a few minutes at the end to answer questions. So as Tom says, please use the Q&A box to add any questions you may have, 
um, and I will be happy to go through. I mean, any questions, simple, challenging, I don't mind. I'll, I'll have a go at any of them. So the operational background, well, it's challenging, of course, as we all know. Um, we're all facing COVID-19 and um, you might you know, fairly ask why I want to talk about green ELT when many schools are struggling even to survive. Um, and the answer, as I've said before, is that COVID is part of a bigger picture. And when COVID is gone, the environmental challenges will remain. And that's summed up in this famous cartoon that I know some of you have seen before. Actually, in some versions, there's a fourth wave, um, which is biodiversity collapse. And um, collectively, um, the climate crisis and biodi biodiversity, sorry, biodiversity collapse um, uh, are called the climate and ecolog ecological crisis. So there's a kind of background drumbeat of doom in the media that's hard to avoid. Uh, we often hear about melting ice, rising sea levels, mass migrations, wildfires, species extinction, and so on. And um, it all feels a very long way from when I and my wife set up our summer school 30 years ago. And at that time, we envisaged a kind of rural paradise where children would connect with nature while learning English. Whereas now, to be honest, we find ourselves asking whether we are part of the solution or part of the problem. And actually, that's a really good question to put up on the wall of your school. I and mean, it begs the question, what problem? In case people haven't realized. <laughs> and it encourages the idea that there are actually solutions. And it seems all this has happened very quickly. I mean, when our eldest son scared us half to death traveling around the world at the age of 18, it never occurred to us or to him to question the flights he was taking on his journey. And yet, just a few years later, his younger brother was refusing to fly to his studies in Sweden. He was preferring to travel overland instead, um, including on one occasion on a bicycle. And we, and by that I mean all of us, have gone very quickly, I think, from a kind of age of innocence to one of experience where we're suddenly aware of the damage we're collectively causing to the planet. And there's no doubt about it, the, uh, the serious scientific, scientific consensus is very clear. We are damaging the biosphere of the planet and our very survival is at stake. This is one of the most consequential decades in human history. That might sound like an exaggeration, but it's not. By 2030, either we will have reduced emissions by 50% and we'll be well on our way to a regenerative world where we turn things around at the last minute, or we will have begun to lose control over our climatic system and it ma will matter less what we do after that. These are the words of Tom Rivett Karnak, who alongside Christiana Figueres, helped bring about the successful Paris Agreement on climate change uh, six years ago. He, sa he said these words in an interview just a couple of weeks ago, and I would like to note, I would like you to note the expression, it will matter less what we do after that. In other words, if we don't take this chance, dot, dot, dot. I think it's a very nice example of English understatement. Well, in addition to the scientific consensus, there's another kind of consensus which British politician Ed Miliband calls the cosy consensus among some people that focus on long term targets rather than short term actions. And don't be misled by that. We don't have time to do nothing. And from a political perspective, the UK will be hosting COP26 in Glasgow later this year when national leaders will get together to discuss progress and implement the next stage of the agreement they signed up to in Paris, hopefully to bear down on global emissions to try to avoid the worst effects of climate change. So there is political momentum in the UK to move the process forward. Unfortunately, sorry, I should say, and fortunately, China and the USA appear now to be moving in the right direction with this. 
And even Vladimir Putin, I understand, has been invited to a virtual heads of state environmental meeting that's being held right now by the USA. China has promised to become carbon neutral by 2060. And it's said that China tends to under promise and over deliver. So there is hope there. Also, as we know, one of Joe Biden's first actions as new president of the USA was to sign up again to the Paris Agreement. But we lost time while America was denying reality, and we need to make up that time now. And finally, in this look at the general operating background, I'd like to refer you to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen these. I like them because they provide a kind of blueprint for a better future and a set of goals that we can refer to and strive towards no matter where we live or work. So how do we respond to this situation? I remember a couple of years ago arriving for a conference in London and meeting up with a colleague from ELT Footprint UK. Before the conference began, we sat outside in the sunlight uh, drinking coffee. My colleague was clutching a book called The Uninhabitable Earth, which I had also read recently. And the book is truly terrifying. It begins with the words, it is worse, much worse than you think. And the contents of the book continue in, in the same vein. Um, the book describes in detail what will happen at various degrees of global warming. And it's a call to everyone to wake up to the reality of what's happening. And I think sitting there in the sunlight, we both kind of felt a bit shocked. I mean, the business of London was going on all around us. And when we went into the conference, people were still choosing to attend sessions on the latest ideas about how to teach vocabulary or how to use new digital tools, literally as if there was no tomorrow. And I think we both wondered, how do people carry on as normal in this way when the very survival of their children is at stake? Don't they know? Don't they care? Or are they deliberately avoiding thinking about it? And I'm guessing most of you have felt something like that too. Either individually or faced with colleagues who either won't or don't want to listen. And psychologically, that's a difficult place to be. I mean, it can be painful to be aware of the need for change and be doing everything one can individually, but be among people or part of an organization that doesn't seem to care. And you can end up feeling a bit like Noah sort of crazily building an ark or uh, perhaps chicken licken warning that the sky is about to fall on our heads. So what can we do about it? I think, first of all, look at our own personal impact on the environment. I'm sure we've all thought about it and know that we all have a carbon footprint, some of us much bigger than others in this unequal world. I mean, we have to get beyond just recycling plastic. I mean, that's good, of course, but it's not enough if we're to encourage others in making real changes. I'm not going to say much more about that now. You've all thought about it, I'm sure. And if you haven't, then a quick Google search will give you plenty of ideas on how to reduce your personal footprint. I'll just say that the most impactful changes you can probably make are around diet and transport. In other words, you need to align, or I suggest that you will feel better aligning your own actions with the actions that you want your colleagues and your institution to take. Secondly, take time to envision a better future. Often we're so bound up with our day-to-day -day lives that we don't stop to allow our, our imaginations to roam and take us to a better place. I mean, the town where I live is a beautiful old place, but it has a problem with traffic. The streets are busy, they're jammed with cars parked on either side of the road. It's dangerous, actually. Um, people are sort of squeezed onto narrow pavements the place is noisy and the air smells of traffic fumes um, and if my children were younger I certainly wouldn't let them cycle down the street and perhaps your town's like this too I don't know often we get so used to it we don't even notice how bad it is 
But now just bear with me for a minute whilst I imagine a better future for the town. Just imagine the main square of the town transformed into a greener future. The, uh, the noisy polluting vehicles have been replaced by silent electric cars, driverless, dropping people off, picking them up on demand. And the streets are now free of all the cars that used to be parked on either side 90% of the time, doing nothing. So the pavements then have been extended to allow everyone more room. So more people go out and meet each other. The main square in the middle of the town that used to be a car park has been turned into a parkland area. The trees and flowers have been planted and families sit around, children playing in the, the now clean air. And the pub that used to face out onto a car park has been able to put out tables and chairs. And it's doing a really good trade now, uh, now that people are able to get there from nearby villages and towns without having to drive. And that's released the back garden of the pub for the production of food, which is now served fresh and local to the visitors. I could go on, I could talk about how the river has been cleaned up and is once again full of fish, how people now grow much of their food and new allotments that have been created around the town and so on. But you get the picture, I hope. So what I'm suggesting is that you take time to envision your place of work your town perhaps, but your place of work at its best and greenest. Uh, while I've been working with people around this, I've learned that many of us actually find it quite difficult to do this. Um, it might feel childish or uncomfortable, but I can tell you it's also hugely liberating and psychologically beneficial in helping to create a forward-looking and positive frame of mind. So when you have a few moments, just allow your, ima your imagination to roam and dream and create a vision of your town and your workplace in a new regenerative future. Don't ask yourself whether it's realistic. Don't allow doubts to enter your mind. Just enjoy the process and build a bright and colourful picture of your ideal world that you can then hang on to. Then think about your life and where you touch power. I don't know exactly who's here with us today. I'm guessing quite a lot of teachers, some academic managers maybe, some publishers, people in marketing, perhaps a few, a few business owners. We all have power of one kind or another. As parents, as teachers, as citizens, as voters, as employees, as employers, as people who buy goods and services, as administrators, as policy makers. Power is quite an emotive word. I often prefer to use the term influence, but that can sound a bit sort of wishy-washy. And maybe what we should talk about is the power to influence. Anyway, please take the time to think about the powers that you have in your own unique situation and then talk to everyone who will listen to help you begin to realize your vision for a better future. So I want to give you some examples of what we um, English country schools have done. Well, we've talked with our host school about the efforts that they are making to reduce their footprint and we've worked out how, can, how we can help with that. We've made big efforts to reduce, reuse and recycle, for example, eliminating single use plastics from our courses and reducing, actually hugely reducing the amount of paper we use for photocopying. We've redesigned our menus, our food menus, to encourage a, a more plant based diet. And we're even planning a vegan cookery course as and when um, we resume operating. We're moving towards paperless teaching and we select course materials that don't glamorize consumptive lifestyles. And we provide learning and leisure activities that encourage pupils to enjoy, reflect on and reconnect with nature. We also offset the carbon impact of every flight taken by pupils and staff to attend our courses. 
and we invest the proceeds into projects that also do social good by aligning with the UN Sustainable Development Goals that we saw earlier. And last but not least, we have recently subjected ourselves to the scrutiny of Green Standard Schools, which is the first externally audited environmental accreditation scheme for language schools. And I'm glad to say we have now earned our badge as an accredited Green Standard School. So what are you going to do? Um, well, as I've said, that depends on your own unique situation, but having envisioned your better future and having identified the powers that you have to make it real, you need to start taking footsteps towards that better future. If you're a classroom teacher, as others have said today, make sure that sustainability and regeneration lie at the heart of your language teaching. Not as an isolated section of a course book, but embedded in everything you do personally and professionally. And I refer you to the excellent ELT Sustainable website for advice on how to integrate environmental issues into your everyday teaching. I also refer you to the award-winning now ELT Footprint Org, um, which has a Facebook site with over three and a half thousand ELT professionals, all bouncing around ideas for everyday actions they can take individually and professionally to make the world a better place. And you'll also find lots of ideas and resources in the influence section of the ELT Footprint UK website. And uh, you can see the URL there. As far as your institution is concerned, take a, uh, have, a, have a look at the Act Now section of the ELT Footprint UK website, and you'll find ideas and advice for bearing down on the carbon footprint of your organisation. You'll find a checklist there that your organisation can use right now to start making changes. And there's advice on reducing use of energy, water, chemicals, paper, ink, plastic, how to reduce the digital carbon footprint of your organization, advice on reducing and mitigating travel, training for staff, gaining accreditation and more. But what if your boss doesn't want to listen? And I'm sorry about the stereotyping here. Um, it's old fashioned, it's an old fashioned idea, but I mean, he's happy dreaming about all the money he's earning, right? So how do you sell these ideas to your boss? Well, first of all, reducing costs and saving money. Nobody's gonna argue with that. Many of the reduction ideas that you'll find at the Footprint website um, will save organizations money. show that you're running a caring organization. I mean, education is all about the future and concern for the planet that our students will inherit, inhabit, shows that we're a caring organization. Learners want to see green credentials. Um, my son, for example, is very particular about who he buys from when it comes to goods and services. So am I for that matter, and so are many of you. So we can't assume that you know, people are just going to continue in the same old way. Learners do want to see green credentials, and they'll be looking for it when they, when they spend their money. And so do staff. Teaching, as I've said, is a caring profession, and um, you want a team that cares about the future of their students and the profession, and they want an employer that does too. So if you want the best staff, you need to be moving your organisation in the direction of sustainability and maybe even regeneration. And finally, don't get overtaken by others. Um, this should really appeal to any bosses out there. I mean, environment, environmental responsibility won't only benefit our planet, it can also be a really good marketing tool. And I, I know that sounds cynical, but as public awareness grows, businesses that can't demonstrate their green credentials are likely to be overtaken by those that do.
again, for further information and um, to expand on that, please see the ELT Footprint UK website. Right. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the impact on myself of trying to face these challenges as a business owner and as a parent and grandparent and as founder of ELT Footprint UK. It's not been easy and like all of you, I'm sure I have my good days and my bad days. And one thing I know for sure is that taking action feels good. More recently, I've come to realize that a kind of level of acceptance about the reality of our situation is also necessary if we're to find a place of calm within ourselves from which we can operate most effectively. And the Climate Coaching Alliance is an excellent organization that aims to work with leaders to move their companies into a regenerative future. Likewise, Leaders Quest, you can Google both of these. And you'll find the links to their websites in the map, which as I say, you'll be able to download. TED um, is an organization that many of you will have heard of. You'll find TED Talks in lots of progressive ELT teaching materials. And TEDx, with an X, is a spin-off that encourages the establishment of local groups, including through discussion groups called circles. I'm a member of a TEDx circle, which is run by members of the Climate Coaching Alliance. And I've found it incredibly helpful to join expertly led to our Zoom session, to our Zoom sessions, <laughs> during which we explore aspects, aspects of leadership and discover, among other things, that our doubts and worries are perfectly normal and shared by others. And I mean, a proper understanding of where we may be heading can feel like a heavy burden. And it's not something anyone should try to carry on their own. So one thing I'd recommend is that you try to find other like-minded people to share your thoughts and feelings with. If a local group doesn't already exist, then set one up. It's easy these days. For example, you can invite colleagues in, in your school and in other schools to join a WhatsApp group um, so that you can get together to talk over and share things um, in a real place, preferably, but uh, on Zoom if you have to. This is important work and you can't do it alone. The other thing I'd recommend is increasing your knowledge and staying up to date with the latest environmental developments so that you have a full grasp of the issues. Um, it's important because people will listen to you better if they think that you know your stuff. And there's a, a wonderful podcast called Outrage and Optimism that will provide virtually everything you need. And if you want to do some more in-depth background reading, Pardon me. Yeah, if you want to do some more in-depth background reading, I recommend that you stay away from the stuff which is only scary, which I began with, and instead choose books that are realistic, yes, but also realistically optimistic. And two of these are Humankind by Rutger Bregman and The Future We Choose by Tom Rivet Carnack and Christiana Figueres. Don't forget Netflix too. If you haven't yet watched Cowspiracy and Seaspiracy, then I suggest you do. And if you're ever unsure about the reliability of a claim, for example, some of the things in Seaspiracy have been challenged, then my go-to expert is George Monbiot, who has spent a lifetime thinking and writing about these things and invariably um, knows what's what. So just Google George Monbiot and you'll find everything you need. Excuse me one moment. Okay. Um, landscape of green ELT. Um, but I, I did want to say one last thing, um, which is that people who don't want to be bothered to act on climate change will sometimes um, try to belittle your efforts. They'll say things like, well, it won't make any difference. Everything's already gone too far. 
we deserve everything we get, and so on. But in doing so, um, I agree with Tom Rivet Karnak that they're making a mistake in confusing meaning with control. Um, I mean, none of us can really know the future or control the outcome of our efforts, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't act. And Tom Rivet Karnak put it like this. He said, if a loved one, say a child, was seriously ill, we might not know or have any control over the outcome, but that certainly wouldn't stop us from doing everything we can to love and take care of that person. And in fact, it would be the most meaningful thing we could do. So I would say, please stay stubbornly optimistic. And in the words of Cristiana Figueres, um, try to reach out and pull the future we want towards us. Um, I and my excellent colleagues at ELT Footprint UK, and I must pay tribute to their passion and their hard work and their expertise, will be organising ongoing discussions to continue learning from experts and from each other. Please sign up via the ELT Footprint UK website for our monthly newsletter um, to be kept informed. And as others have said, please use the hashtag Green ELT in your social media messaging to help all of us in this Green ELT movement connect and build a better future for ourselves, for our profession and for the planet. So happy Earth Day. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them now. Excellent. Wow. Thanks so much, Chris, for a really brilliantly clear presentation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you for taking the time to put that together and for coming to the event today. So, everybody, we're running slightly over time. We, I can see something's popped up in the question box. OK. We'll run through a couple of questions, but we've got to keep it fairly quick. Yep. Those those are the rules. So Twitter answers, please. Chris, 140 characters only. <laughs> okay, so the first one, and this was a this was a question that I was going to ask, given given the industry that we work in, especially let's face it, if we're in UK ELT, where there's probably a fairly easy riposte to lots of this in that we're flying students to the UK. So you spoke about this, but there's a question within our sphere of influence, power and ELT, where do you think we should be focusing our efforts for change? Well, the short answer, we should focus on the areas where we can make the greatest impact. Um, in terms of UK ELT, um, probably that is flights. Um, and we have to try and get ourselves on the right side of history with this, uh, because if we are to survive, as a species, we have to get our carbon footprint down. So there's a whole section on the ELT Footprint UK website on flights. And the short answer is we're in a bit of a quandary. We can't, we want people to fly to us. We want more people to fly to us or at least to travel to us. And the vast majority of those journeys will be by flight. We should have, there are obviously things we can do to encourage people not to fly. We can encourage people to stay longer making more of their flights but ultimately we have to offset the impact of those flights and many organizations have started to do that um, that's one of the things i am most proud about um, in terms of what we've achieved so far i would encourage everybody to do the same great thank you and we've got a, a sort of question comment but i'd really like to put it to you chris because i really found parts of your talk very energizing I would say in the way that you talk about coming up against this issue that we're about to outline and how we stay positive and how we stay active and trying to make a change i think because like you say you can start reading about this and it can be very very <laughs> demotivating let's say it would be the polite way of putting it i think so the question is um thanks so much for the talk all very useful we're trying to go greener in the office with ink and recycled paper etc but it's all very expensive ultimately we have to get many items shipped to us um and i guess of course we've got the students coming so it's hard to see how it may be worth doing 
Now, I really wanted to ask this question to you, Chris. I'm really grateful to the person that did ask that because let's face it, we are going to go back to face-to-face events. We've got a conference full of people. It's brilliant to see our audience here, but I suspect we're getting people that are keen on this issue already. So what do we say to people when we hear, oh, I'm not sure it's worth doing this or it's too hard? Yeah. It's difficult to see yeah. how it's worth so, doing. So, so two quick answers to that. One, uh, your clients are likely to require it from you. Right. And if you're not doing it, they'll go to somebody who does. Um, second one is what you're really saying is that your bottom line, your profits are more important than um, our future. And I don't think many people will take very kindly to that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Well, we've run on to six past, so we've gone over a bit, but that's absolutely fine. We're in a break time, but we will draw it to an end there. So once again, on behalf of everyone in the room and on behalf of English UK, Chris, thanks so much for being involved in the conference. And thanks so much for what you do with um, ELT Footprint, actually. We really enjoy supporting you. I know that Eleanor's really encouraged in the work that she does with you. And we try, we try to fight these things. It's not an easy win. It's not an instant win, but we keep going. So thanks so much for everything you do, Chris. And Thank you too, Tom. I'd like to return the compliment. Um, English UK has been very supportive. And I think having... Uh, um, um, running through um, Earth Day has been great idea and really um energizing and, and successful so thank you very much indeed for that absolute pleasure absolute pleasure absolute and pleasure. Absolute. thanks so much for everyone joining the session and joining the conference so it is earth day we've got one more session coming up at 3 30 which is the british council talking about this topic so i'm sure we will see you all there we hope you've had a great day Please, after the event, complete your feedback. Let us know what you think, because it really helps us to put on more events like this or change them as you like to see them. So again, thanks so much for joining. We'll see you in the final plenary. Hope you've had a great day and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you, everyone.